All right, we're starting tonight a how-to series. And those of you coming in by the garage, we appreciate it. We're doing a staff meeting, not really. We're having a meeting with you in an hour Bible study, really getting in some how-tos about the Word of God. In this series, we're going to look at not only the how-tos, but how to walk in a greater spiritual walk with the Lord. I believe that many Christians today would enjoy an abundance of life more if they would just know what to do and how to do it. I think this will be a fun series if we can teach you some of these practical truths that will also, as you apply them in your life, will produce some great results according to what the Bible has promised us. Amen? The Bible also teaches us that we do have an enemy and he does not like us if we could, if we could get, or let me say it, I kind of read it wrong. The enemy hates everything that we do, okay? And he doesn't like us, especially when we get a hold of the word of God. So this series I want and I have designed it to give you practical and common sense wisdom on your daily life so that you reach your goals and become all that we can be for God. Someone say amen. Amen. So let's look and see what the scripture says. I'm going to bring up three scriptures for you. 2 Timothy 2.15 and then James 1.16 through 18. This is a Bible study. And we love questions too. Hope you get some as you're taking notes with us tonight. And then John 10, 10 and 11. Okay, so I'm reading 2 Timothy 2.15 and it says, Be diligent, or the old King James says, Be or study, be diligent or study to present yourself approved to God. Approved to who? Now folks, let me ask you. Do we look for God's approval by works? Or do we get approved by God? By accepting his son. We get approved by God. It says we are accepted in the beloved. So by accepting Jesus Christ, we are given, okay, uh, we're approved to God. But what happens is people that have God in their heart, but they don't do anything about the word. They don't seek to change. They don't look at, you know, God loved us so much that he saved us, right? And he saved us the way we were, right? But aren't you glad that God is smart enough not to leave us that way? To keep changing us? Over, yeah, amen. So study to, to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Who can tell me really quickly, rightly dividing the word of truth? Maybe a scripture. Can you, you think of one? Yeah. The Lord is light and in him is no darkness is all. Okay. God, every good and perfect gift, we're going to read that here in a little later, comes from where? Above. Yeah. Where he doesn't change. Nor alter. He, God's not going to be crabby one day. And then, uh, then he's going to treat um, Linda a different way. No, he treats us all the same. He treats us as He treats us through love. Amen. So James chapter 1, look at this, verse 16 through 18. Do not be deceived. I wonder if James understood a lot about the deceptions in those days. Do not be deceived, my brethren. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness, doesn't change, and no shadow of turning. God doesn't... Treat one person one way and another person another way. God is no respecter of persons. And in verse 18, and he says, of his own will, he brought us forth. That's you and I. But he brought us forth by the what? He brought us forth by the word of truth. Yeah. That we might be the kind of first fruits of his creatures. In other words, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new what? Creatures, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So guess what? We're God creatures now. You have God living on the inside of you. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He's brought the kingdom. Amen. Back in Jesus' time before he died and rose again, he says the kingdom of God is, is at hand. But nowadays, Paul spoke it. He says the kingdom of God is within you. 
now that we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Now drop down to the third scripture, John 10. Verse 10 and 11 says, The thief, talking about the devil, does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what Satan's job is. His job is to what? Steal, rip you off, kill, and to destroy. In other words, he's the enemy of all righteousness, and God's space is against him. And if we want to do good in this life, We've got to buddy up with God and turn our face also against evil. Say amen. All right. And he says, look, and it goes on to say, and that I have come, Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Do you have all the abundance of life that you think God promised? Well, no, but how many here would like to have it? Yay. Amen. So we, we go after it, don't we? We seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, things that we have need of, shall be added unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. So you don't seek for things, you seek for God. And God will add things to you. But when you seek for things, things will break. You'll get dissatisfied. Maybe you'll get more than one, leave one on the floor. Who knows, leave one in the car and it gets ripped off. You'll find that if you don't take good care of the stewardships of what God gives you, the enemy will try to steal it. We know that, all right? All right, so our first point tonight is, how does the enemy know when to attack? How does the enemy know when to attack? Well, number one, we all have what's called a countenance. And if we go to Genesis chapter 4, the very first verses, God confronts Cain about Abel. Cain slew his brother Abel. But he said to Cain, he says, where is your brother? Your, why has your countenance fallen? So the enemy looks at the light shining off of us. Remember, we're kind of like that projector. Once we accept Jesus Christ in our heart, there's the light. Blam in our spirit. It reflects out through our thinking. Make sure you don't get think, stinking thinking because then it won't, it'll only leak out instead of pour out. Because the lens of your soul blocks or yields to the light of Christ that comes out of your spirit. And then it's projected on your flesh. Now, I'm going to say this. Do you have something in your life maybe that's really hard to overcome? You can overcome from what I'm about to, about to share with you tonight. You are an overcomer. But if you don't cleanse that lens and you don't expose the lens of how you look at things, then what will happen is that will keep your thinking and the ability of your responding and living limited because you think it's this way when actually God says it's this way. That's why we consult the scripture. That's why we have a Bible study. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will not pass away. Do you see how simple that is? But we don't line our life up with the word. We kind of think we're doing good. But what did God say? God says, be careful not to lean to your own understanding. Right? Rather, God would have us trust him with all our heart. And lean not to our own understanding. In all our ways, do our best to acknowledge that he's here. And acknowledge that he's the one that causes us to do good in our life. And then it says, he will direct your path. Boy, I like that promise. Can you say amen? So remember, Satan is looking at your countenance. So don't give him big lip surface. Don't look like you've been sucking on a persimmon. If you're having a rough day, don't let your face project it. Please don't. Why? Because if he is around, he's going to let everybody know, hey, we're getting to the guy. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Wise Socks or Mrs. Wise Socks, look, her face gives out the fact that she's troubled. Martha, Martha, you are troubled about many things. So we want to avoid that if we can. Someone say Amen. So the enemy looks at a countenance. Now, as your pastor and other pastors too, many pastors today by the Spirit are given the gift of discerning of spirits. 
What that means is you can see spiritual conditions on people. It's pretty scary if you think your pastor can see where you've been and where you've not. You know, it's pretty hard on me because I have to ignore it. <laughs> Amen. It's kind of like when you know your son Jimmy is up to no good and you know it's his birthday. So how are you going to handle that? Are you going to really get on Jimmy's case or are you going to wait till after? You know, there's that little reasoning fact. Well, the part I'm trying to make is the enemy just wants you, your countenance to drift down a little bit so he knows that whatever is working on you is beginning to take effect. And we don't want to allow that. So how else can the enemy know when to attack? The words of our mouth and the tone. Yeah. Our words and tone. I hope you're taking notes on your notes. Because tone is not in there. Our words and our tone. Well, how you doing, Pastor Kerry? Well, I'm doing pretty good. How you doing? Now, you see, my answer was okay. But what was wrong with that answer? Mm -hmm. The tone wasn't. Now, we got to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves, don't we? So make sure your tone. God, I come to you. <laughs> you know, just kind of hamming it a little bit so nobody falls under condemnation, please. Because what the Holy Spirit does through me a lot is he nails you. He, he literally reads your, your mail. And, the, and if you're not careful, the enemy will say, yeah, he doesn't love you anymore. So sometimes when the Spirit of God is moving and God goes, Hello, let me remind you. It's only me, if it comes out of here, it's only a reminder of something God's already talking to you about. It isn't something me trying to get you to do what I want. No, it's the anointing coming out of me and the words of, of his word. I mean, the scripture and the Spirit of God. Sometimes it's pretty amazing. It says sometimes the hearts of certain people are revealed and they fall down confessing their sins. So we don't want somebody to milk toast the word. So the enemy listens to our words. How do we talk? You know, we can use some, we can use some negative examples. We can drone a little. And all these things I've done. So please, don't, don't go. No, all these things I've done. Who do you think the Holy Spirit and me wrote this thing? And who am I writing it to? Myself. The third thing the enemy knows, how he reads us and knows when to attack, is our actions. Yeah. What we do or don't do. Right. Hello? Amen. God awards loyalty and obedience more than anything else. Amen. If you're loyal to your wife, then you will never say one bad thing to another person about your wife. You'll just go ahead and let her have it. No, <laughs> I'm joking. No, when you discuss things, you know what I mean? We want to let our actions project something. Now, remember years ago, and here recently I brought it up again, God leaves a fingerprint on everything that he does, Marvin. If God does something for you, he leaves his character fingerprint. So that you know it's him. It's not the enemy tricking us. And you say, well, where do I find that? 1 Corinthians 12, where it says, God exhorts, comforts, and edifies. So a sermon should exhort, comfort, and edify. A prophecy should exhort, comfort, and edify. When God speaks to you personally about doing something, it should exhort, comfort, and edify. And everybody gets the comfort and the edify part. That's a good part, right? But they don't get the exhortation. What is, or can anybody tell me what exhortation means? Kind of corrective teaching and uplifting way. A corrective teaching and beckoning to change. Okay. You know, people will say, and fight. They'll fight change because they think that they're doing all right. But if you go to God and you say, God, how am I really doing? And you don't hear anything. You stay there long enough to hear something. Why? He's trying to help us. He's trying to get through. Amen. Now, folks, Jesus came to liberate us. We got to let him do his job. Well, Brother Kerry, I got liberated when I accepted Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. And you did. You did. But then you got to dwelling on things and some of that junk came on back. What, are you a terrible person now? No, you've got to deal with those things. God is saying, hey, let's deal with this. 
Everybody sees it but you. Let's deal with this. Of course, we've all been there. Say amen. Let's go on. So our actions really testify of where we are and where we're not, especially in front of the enemy. It's our witness. Can you say amen? And then another, <coughs> excuse me, and then another area that the enemy knows is how he can smell our negativity. Hello. Now, you know what it's like when somebody's out fishing for a month. You know, they're a little bit ripe, a week, a couple of days. You know what I mean? But in the spirit realm, there's an odor. There's a good smell. The aroma, I think it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, where the aroma of life in Christ Jesus and the aroma of death. So the aroma of life is when we focus on God and we just fill the praise no matter what. Here, sure, things are topping. Yeah, you're not always going to be perfect. But when you're corrected, the Bible says, happy you should be shall it yield peaceable fruits of righteousness. Of course, you know what? If you want a, a book to write that nobody will buy, just teach on the chastening of the Lord. But see, the chastening of the Lord is not talking about punishment. It's talking about God talking to you and correcting you so that you function better and that you don't shorten your life. Did you know many, many good Christians probably could live a few extra years if they listened to God a little more accurately? Moving right along. Okay, you guys. So tell me really quickly, according to your notes, the enemy watches our what? Countenance. Number two, he listens to our words and tone. Be careful that they're good. And folks, sometimes silence is golden. You know? Okay, sometimes don't answer anything if you're not in the mood. Just smile and say, that's not the time. Yeah. Thirdly, our actions. Because our actions speak louder than words. words. And then fourthly, he can smell us. Folks, if you don't dump the garbage in your kitchen and you forget it, and then you take off for a week on vacation, you know what you're going to come back to? Yeah. You're going to come back to an odd smell, okay? Well, think about it. If you don't pray, you don't read your word, you don't keep in good fellowship, you're going to move over into the physical realm of the flesh again, and you're going to put out a fleshly odor. I'm not talking about a human odor or a non-bath odor. I'm talking about a negative fleshly odor because a natural man does not grasp the things of the Spirit. To him, they seem foolishness. So when God wants to give us a piece of good advice, if we're in the natural, we're liable to say, is that you, God? <laughs> All right, let's move on. First Peter, look at this scripture. Here's a good one to keep us balanced. Everyone say balance. balance. Say, I love balance. God wants me balanced. Amen. He doesn't want me spending more than I have. He doesn't want me driving more than I have gas. He wants me balanced, right? You stay up all night and, and not get your rest and wonder why your body's breaking down. Balance. Let's have balance. So, so it's very important. But look at the balance that Peter writes about. He says, likewise, you younger people. Jenny's here tonight. You younger people, submit yourself to your elders, moms and dads, elder people. I mean, I mean, come on. Strangers that are elder are not going to tell your children what to do. You understand. In other words, younger Christians submit to the older Christians, and the older Christians listen to the younger. In other words, we're all in this together. Yes, all of you be submissive one to another and be clothed with what? Notice the word clothed there. Did you notice that? Where do we put our clothing? On our flesh, on our body. So it says all the time when you're walking around, make sure your flesh has God's humility on it. Don't come busting in telling everybody just how much you, you know. You know? And you might know a lot. I just love to listen to people and, and they'll go and they'll sit down to a good meal and a bunch of people and then they'll just rip the meal apart. That's not a very good testimony. Hello. I used to do that. That's not good. No, submit one to another. Say, hey, look at the meal and say, what good is in there? There's some good in there. Pick out the good and enjoy it. Otherwise, you're going to find out 
that you're going to pick on and people's faults. One day you're liable to get mad at your pastor and even loathe the fact he comes around. You know? And so, or the president, look at <laughs> Boy, I would love our president to show up. Wouldn't that be great? But some people wouldn't. You know what I mean? So we got to be careful what we undertake. So, we need to submit one to another. God, because what? God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. humble. Okay. We all know what proud, pride is, positive and negative, And he gives blessings to love. So we're to clothe ourselves with what? Humility. humility. And what does God do with humility? He graces us. Yes. He graces us. So you want more grace and more help in a time of need? Well, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all of your care. Remember, when we get our mind all cluttered, all full of care, we've got to give it over on him. It'll, it'll slow us down. Casting all of your care over on him because he cares for you. Be sober. Be of a sound mind. Be vigilant. Alert. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking... Whom he may devour. I got the hiccup, so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm pausing. Verse 9 says the first two words. Verse 9, what does it say? It says, resist him. Yeah, good job, you guys. Resist him. When enemy comes around and you start having negative thoughts, what do you do? Resist him. Amen. Change your thinking. How many here know how to do that? Just speak your name or praise the Lord out loud and your brain will stop to listen to what your mouth is saying. Try it sometimes. It's a lot of fun. We used to have exercises with this. Okay. So resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings, everybody goes through this, are experienced by your brethren in the world. Is you know any other Christian Anywhere that's not being tempted once in a while, that's not being accused of something once in a while, it's not getting a tough time. That's why we need to be in church. That's why we need to be encouraging one another. Why? Because the world's not going to do it for us. Can you say amen? The world hated Jesus, he said. It's going to hate you too. Didn't he say in the world you're going to have tri tribulation? But then he says something really neat. He says, but fear not little flock, for I have overcome the world. Actually, what he's saying is, when we learn to walk in him, we're automatic overcomers. We're not autom falling to problems all the time. No, when we learn to walk with him, when we learn to meet with him, we're, we're, we're living in that victory. Why? Because God does it in us. Can you say amen? amen? All right, so giving no place to the enemy. How many know... But if you, if you give him an inch, he'll probably take a, try to take a mile, right? I mean, it's just like some old people I know years and years ago. You know, you give them a little of this, and they want to take a little more of that, and, you know. Okay, here's our scripture on that. Oh, I turned my page too soon. Okay, um, Romans 8, 1 through 9. I love Romans 8 for some reason. Because Paul has just got through saying how tough it was for him to be a Pharisee in Romans 7. How he wanted to do good, but evil was present with him. He realized that in his body, that was in his flesh, no good thing abided. So Christians today, you got to realize you can't trust your flesh anymore. Even though it can obey you when you're in tune with God, because it has to pick up food, put it in your mouth. It has to obey you when you say, do this and do that. That's not the evil part. What's the evil part is the part that fights you when you know it in your heart. You, you need to work on that and then your flesh is fighting you. Then what do you do, Pastor Kerry? Well, you begin to resist the enemy, but you submit to God first and say, God, I need some help on this because the war is pretty tough on my mind. The enemy comes to the mind because that's usually our weakest place. And then he wants to sit there long enough to almost convince that maybe that's the case. I mean, that's how he works. There's some great teachings and great books out. Uh, 
Joyce Meyer has one on the battlefield of the mind. I had one years and years ago, a series called The Battlefield of the Mind, before I ever met Joyce. But that doesn't matter. There's a lot of good teaching on renewing the mind and getting that soul realm that's so gentle and tender at times under the blood of Jesus. So submit one to another, elder to the younger, younger to the elder. God resists the proud. So we can't be proud. God clothes us with humility. Lord, clothe us. And you know what it says, put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. So what do we do? We get up in the morning, we meet with God, and we say, all right, I'm just going to clothe myself in you. I'm just going to get enveloped in you. I'm just going to get soaked in you, God. I'm just going to get full of you, God. And then when you say, all right, let's go through the day, I'm going to get up and go into my day knowing that you're taking the lead, Jesus, you know? You're taking the lead. So, giving no place to the enemy. I, it says, therefore, there is now, those get born again right now, now that you're born again, there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Now, there's a comma after that. What it really means is, God is no longer condemning you who have his son in your heart. The world is condemned already because it's in agreement. They're in agreement, don't know it, with the enemy in the course of this world. And the spirit that now works on the sons of disobedience. Ephesians 2. But the whole thing here is that once we get born again, God is not giving judgment on us. He's not condemning us. So we shouldn't have any business pointing our finger at somebody else's fault. And man, I really have to resist not picking on somebody's fault because the idea is to get somebody to get with God and change and, and not to make somebody feel bad so they're embarrassed about it, you know? And I'm learning all about that. How many know sometimes with our children it's kind of touchy and then with me, grandchildren, I have 11 of them. Aren't they wonderful, cutie, cutie little ones? But they grow up. They become teenagers. Amen. That wonderful age. Okay, there is therefore now, those that are born again, no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Now, gives a comment, it says, who do not walk like their old ways, according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now you're going to learn to walk the new way. Can you say, in the newness of life. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, now that's inside of your spirit, has made me free from the law of sin and death. Folks, what was the law meant to do? What was the Ten Commandments meant to do? Show us our sin and how we can't do it ourselves. How we have need of our Savior. How need of help. So a prideful person will say, I don't need any help. And won't ask for help. While a humble person will say, I need all the help I can get. Jesus, don't leave me alone. See the difference? One thinks they're doing cool, but is displaying pride and actually hindering. And the other is, you say, well, that sounds, no, God, I need your help. I can't do anything without you. Now you're getting it. And that way, when things happen, you know who gets the credit? Glory to God. Amen. And that's always best to give God the credit. All right, so. It says, but the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, the Ten Commandments, in that it was weak through the flesh, our flesh, okay, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on the account of sin, man's sin, he condemned sin in the flesh and the righteous requirement of the law was then fulfilled, might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. And the Lord showed me something and this one's hard for a lot of Christians. But every time you get in the flesh, you bring condemnation upon yourself. It doesn't come from God. Hello. But if you get convicted... It's God saying, hey, let's work together and let's change. So when we know to do something and don't do it, condemnation is going to come. But it's not going to come from God. This is where we get all messed up. It's going to come from the devil. You didn't do something God needed you to do, and God's not going to condemn you. He's going to say, we'll do that again. It's all right. But the devil says, now you've done it. 
You see how it works? Now you've done it. You better hide. You know. What did Adam do? God said, have you eaten of the tree that I told you not to eat of? Are you hiding because of that? When you're doing things wrong, we hide. The natural man wants to hide, wants to excuse. And oh, God forbid if we lie about it. God forbid if we lie about it. Because that's deceit. And that's the enemy. That's the very flavor of him. So we want to avoid those things. Say amen. Resist the devil. Yes. Amen. Yes. We're turning about how to overcome the devil. How to overcome evil. What does the Bible say? We overcome evil with good. Amen. You're getting it. All right. So let's read on. So the righteous requirement of the law, listen, might be fulfilled in us. See, we were guilty. Now we're not because we're with Christ. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set and dwell on the things of the flesh. How am I going to do it? This is the problem I have. The bridge is out before I even look. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded or self-minded is death, will separate you. But to be spiritually minded, having your mind focused on God, is life and peace. Yes. Because the carnal mind wants to follow God, but can't. We just read that in Romans 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity or in division against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Nor indeed can it be. Wow, that's important. So then, what do we do? Those that are in the flesh cannot please God. What do we do? Get out of the flesh. Ask God to help you. Amen. Got a little excited there. But if you're, you're not in the flesh, listen to what he says. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. I have God dwelling in me. You have God dwelling in me. You have God dwelling in you. But we all know there are those times that it's not God taking the lead. Can someone say, oh, me real quickly? It's okay. And so we should be able to, with God's help, to recognize those things quickly. So we don't get out of sorts for any length of time. And, and God be that anybody else see us that way. Quiet in here, but let's move right on. I'm talking to myself here, folks. To the camera people. Amen. I'm glad you came to this crew meeting. All right, now. A couple of points I want to give under all this, and then we'll be done. Now, we're finishing up kind of early, but that's okay. Number one, as a Christian, do your best to walk in love. The Bible says we're rooted and to be grounded in it. Ephesians 3. Walk in love. And he's not talking about good old sloppy agape kind of love. He's not talking about man kind of love. You know, that kind of love when you says, you are my friend, but if you blow it, you're never going to be my friend again. That's not the love he's talking about. Walk in the love of God, okay? Be rooted and grounded in it. Number two, don't judge others. Pray for others. You see something wrong, pray for them. Amen. Strife, angry, being upset shuts down your blessings. Amen. And, and it causes, it causes a, uh, one another to despise one another after a while. Thirdly, keep your bag empty. You go to sleep at night, dump your bag. What do you mean? Everything that was rough during the day, give it all over to God. So when you close your eyes, you don't have any regrets or any frustrations. Say amen, somebody. Dump your bag. You're a Hoover vacuum. You're sucking up things during the day. Dump it at night. It gives place to the enemy if you don't. It's, <clears throat> remember, at night, it's the lock. And in the door, for your prayer in the morning, it's a door to your day. Fourthly, stay away from compromise. It gives place to the enemy. Fifthly, forgive right away. And release any trespass into God's hands. Sixthly, seek to restore and care for others. Resist, uh, excuse me, resist being selfish or name calling or anything that tries to promote you being right all the time. Seven, 
put aside all negativity, being critical, sitting back and criticizing things. It's not good and it makes you smell. I mean, you think of somebody who starts criticizing another pastor or another minister, another church, or somebody's cooking or something like that. It's just not good. Let's keep it away from ourselves. Say amen. Okay. All right. And then uh, finally, eight, keep your thinking, speaking, and doing. Bathe in love. Pray and be in the word and enjoy one another. Remember, if you have Kick the enemy nice and hard all your life, okay? Don't think that he will forget it. I think too many people do that. They'll really get aggressive and they'll kick the enemy and then they'll let themselves get lukewarm and then kick back and the enemy starts kicking the snot out of them. Good friend of mine, Lester Summerall, maybe you didn't know that about me, but he was one of my other friends Lester was having a dream. This is a good one to share. He was having this recurrent dream from God. He knew it was from God. And in the dream, he was holding a snake, a deadly asp, with a big long stick with a Y in it, and he was holding it away from him. And then he saw in the dream that he dropped the stick, and the snake came right up and bit him. And he'd wake up, and he'd have this over and over again. Well, my friend Truman Dillingham, years ago from from Portland down, no, I was actually somewhere down in Oregon, uh, Coos Bay or something down there. He, he Just a silly man of God, doesn't know anything. He's not trying to be famous. And, and as soon as he mentioned that he was at the convention, he says, that's what God said to me. So he waited for uh, Lester to not be so busy and he got up there and he says, I think I, I have the interpretation for your dream. Of course, Lester pulled the chair out and says, you sit down, have lunch with me. And he says, all your life you've been beating on the devil, casting out devils, and preaching all over the world. And now you're thinking about retiring. And God says, you'll never retire because you don't sit down and stop doing that. The enemy's going to kick you. He says, you just keep on doing it till your last breath. Just remind the enemy's defeated and doing all that. And boy, I tell you what, it was just like a Holy Ghost party. Sometimes we just need to be listening. Can you say amen? Yeah. So remember, keep your armor on. Yeah. How do we put on the armor? Father, in Jesus' name, then God clothes you in the armor. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the armor of light. Yeah. Satan can't stand light. Yeah. Can't stand God. He whips him every time. So clothe yourself with God, not yourself. It's not, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I gotta have, I gotta have. Me, 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 I, 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 I. Be careful of that. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Walk in the Spirit, stay close to God. These are the times it's, it's not a good thing for you to be hanging out. You're, and I, I don't want you to be another casualty. James 4, 5, or excuse me, 4, 6 through 8 says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to you humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will run in terror from you. He will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Amen? Amen? Questions? Anybody have any? Again, this is the first one of our how-to series. We'll be going through all kinds of things like how to operate in the gifts, how to appropriate the promises, how to learn to intercede, how to pray properly, receive revelation knowledge, how to trust God, how to be led by the Spirit. How to, just tons of them. I have 50 lessons for the entire year with two weeks vacation.